So a little disclaimer about this video. Um, it is your Fred Factor reading for the week. However, my kids are extremely loud and obnoxious in the background. So even though you won't see them in the room, you'll probably hear them banging on the door. So just be aware that that's all that's going on. They're playing with their father and they're banging on the door and I apologize. So enjoy this reading of Fred Factor. Hello, entrepreneurship and applied business students. Um, I am wearing my sunglasses today, which if you uh, have been following any of the information on the school um, Facebook page and stuff like that, there is a virtual spirit week going on. And so uh, I am wearing my sunglasses to signify Tuesday, which is the Shades Day. And for those of you interested in participating, tomorrow is wear your favorite team, um, jersey or t-shirt. So it's game day. Um, so have fun with that if you would like to along this process. Uh, we are going to jump back into Fred Factor. Again, it's by Mark Sanborn. And uh, last we read, we were talking about Fred sighting. So starting to notice the Freds that exist in your society or in your area. Um, and right now in lockdown, that may be hard to notice, but maybe it's easy in some regards. Um, so just, you know, kind of pay attention to that and then especially make yourself aware of it when we get back out into the real world and stuff like that. Um, but we are beginning part two today and we're going to go through the first uh, two chapters of part two and it's all about becoming a Fred. So what does this mean for us personally? After reading this far, you may be saying, I wish I knew, lived, and worked with more people like Fred the Postman. We would all benefit from a world populated by people like Fred, people who take that kind of pride in their work and turn the ordinary into extraordinary. How many Freds are in your organization or school? Have you ever found yourself saying, I wish I had more people like that around here? Do you regret that some of your teammates might be accurately described as anti-Freds? So how can we get more Freds in the world? Well, that's easy answer, be a Fred. It can all start with you. If you want a world with more Freds, be a Fred. Only when you make the ordinary extraordinary will others see the possibilities for themselves. It isn't that hard. Actually, it's harder not to be a Fred. The skills and the abilities that enable us to be Fred-like often come naturally. They come out of who we already are. If you didn't have at least an interest or more likely a burning desire to make the most of your career and relationships, you wouldn't have made it this far into the book. Partially, I'm forcing you, but you know. One thing seems common to all human beings, a passion for significance. I've never met anyone who wanted to be insignificant. Everyone wants to count. To know that he or she does that what he or she does each day isn't simply a means of making a living, but a living of making meaning. The unhappiest people of all may as well be those who go to jobs that they hate because they need the money. Why not go to a job that you love because you need the money? You can convert your job into one that you love, not by doing a different job, but by doing the one that you have differently. That's what makes a Fred unique. Thousands of men and women deliver the mail, but for some, it's just a job. For many, it may be an occupation they enjoy, but for a few like Fred, delivering the mail becomes a calling. The person doing the work determines the difference between the mundane and the magnificent. You choose. Which do you prefer, enjoyment or misery? Feeling good about your work or feeling bad about it? Being tired or hiding the real you? Is it harder to be miserable, negative, and insincere than it is to be happy, positive, and genuine? All Freds share those latter characteristics no matter what type of work that they do. Most people think that they get ahead in life by learning something new. I believe you can also get ahead by going back to the basics of success. There are lots of ways to define true success, but I believe that having the most fun doing your best work is at the top of the list. All it takes is reestablishing the things that you've always known or the lessons that you learned in kindergarten or Sunday school and starting to reapply them to your life and your work. An interruption. Do the right thing for the right reason. Here's a mystery. If you experience praise and recognition, it will seldom come. I really don't think um, or don't know why, but life has demonstrated repeatedly that if your motive for doing something is to receive thanks or praise, you'll often be disappointed. If, however, you go about doing the right thing, knowing that doing it on its own is its own reward, you'll be fulfilled whether or not you get recognition from others. When reward or recognition comes, it will be icing on the already tasty cake. Your possibilities are endless. 
Here's my take on why people love to hear the story of Fred the Postman. It reminds them that not only of what is, impo what is possible, but their own potential as well. Excellence, wisdom, dedication are all functioning parts of Fred's world. The mediocrity, foolishness, and lack of commitment that we encounter every day seems like poor substitutes. Fred's remind us that we can choose the right role models. Fred's set an inspiring example for their companies, organizations, teammates, customers, friends, and family. When others see infinite ways to create excellence and how and wow in their work, then they too will become Fred's. Something wonderful will happen. The energy that they once um, had will be restored, enthusiasm will replace cynicism, and action will overcome complacency. The feedback, recognition, and satisfaction that come from being a Fred will fuel ongoing quality efforts. Everyone makes a difference. Here's the quote for this first chapter. All men matter. You matter. I matter. It's the hardest thing in theology to believe. It's a beautiful spring morning in Cincinnati. Since I wasn't scheduled to speak until noon, I left my hotel and found a nearby coffee shop. After paying for a cup of coffee, free refills, I strolled outside to sit at the sidewalk table and read my newspaper. For the next 20 minutes, I enjoyed the reading and the sipping. A cab stand was nearby and I noticed an older woman at the wheel of the second cabin line. She got out to stretch and I looked at the coffee shop behind me. I didn't need to be a clairvoyant um, I didn't need to be clairvoyant to realize that she was thinking about going inside. I got up and walked over to her. Care for a cup of coffee, I asked. Well, that would be great, she replied. How do you take it? Black. She was my kind of coffee drinker. I went into the coffee shop, got my free refill, and paid a little over a dollar for a cabbie's coffee. And when I returned to the cab, she was digging into her pockets for change. Oh, don't worry about it, I said. The coffee's on me. As I picked up my paper and started back to the hotel, the last thing I saw was the woman standing speechless, a look of amazement on her face. That buck and change was the best money I spent that day. I was afraid, which gave me a whole lot of satisfaction, and maybe I passed on some inspiration too. Did you wake up this morning intending to change the world? To admit that you began, um, to admit that you begin the day planning to change the world certainly sounds grandiose and maybe even delusional. Yet I believe that you do change the world every day, whether you intend to or not. Often it only takes a small act to make a big difference. You change the world with your spouse or your kids, depending on how you interact with them before you leave the house. A little extra time and attention or a tender moment of affection changes their world that day. And it reminds you of what is important when the mad dash to the office irks you or makes you feel that your day is off to a rough start. You change the world of another driver when you allow her to change lanes abruptly without blaring your horn, recognizing that she too is human and fallible. Of course, you alter her world in a different way if you blast your horn, yell, and gesture obscenely. You also change the world of a coworker, a customer, a vendor, or a cafeteria worker with your smile or your frown. No, these aren't dramatic changes. They won't alter the course of world affairs or bring about a cure for AIDS, but who's to say that these little changes don't have a cumulative, profound effect in the lives of others and ultimately in your own life? Everybody makes a difference every day. You can read books on how to make a difference. You can probably, you've probably heard teachers, pastors, and speakers exhorting their listeners to make a difference. The fact is that everybody is already making a difference every day. The key question is what kind of difference is each of us making? To make a difference means to affect another person, group, or a situation. It is nearly impossible to remain neutral as you travel throughout your day. Paying attention to others, giving them the respect that they deserve, and politely serving them makes a positive difference. In contrast, neglecting, criticizing, and belittling others, whether intentionally or not, produces a negative difference. The key is to pay attention to the kinds of differences that you are making. As my friends and motorcycle buddy, Jim Cathcart says, to know more, notice more. You shouldn't be asking, did I make a difference today? Of course you did. You undoubtedly affected somebody's life, maybe slightly, maybe significantly. The most important question to ask yourself is what kind of difference did I make? Even better than random acts of kindness. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker, practice random acts of kindness. That's good advice, but I have something to add. Why not practice acts of extraordinary regularity? 
Even the least Fred-like person can occasionally, even accidentally, do something outstanding. When it happens, we should recognize and celebrate it by positively reinforcing the behavior. The purpose of this book is to help you think, act, and become Fred-like. To bring the same spirit of magnanimity to your work, relationships, and life as a Fred, as Fred did to his. Not periodically, but persistently. You can learn to look at the world through Fred-colored glasses. The things that you do, both small and large, cumulatively create a lifestyle that becomes apparent to anyone paying the slightest bit of attention. It's the kind of example that most influences others. The power of a committed individual. It's helpful to be reminded of how far-reaching our impacts can be on others. In 1962, Dick Jordan was a rookie teacher at Washington, George Washington High School in Denver. He invited students to meet him on the first day of the millennium at the west entrance of the Denver Public Library downtown. On the appointed day, nearly 30 years later, some three students showed up. Sorry, some 300 students showed up. When reporters asked them why they came, the answers were simple. They felt that Jordan cared for them. He taught them how to think and to question what was in history books, and in at least one case, he had inspired a student to become a teacher. The husband of one student came, be, came because it was one of the last things that his wife had asked him when she was dying of cancer. It had begun as kind of a joke. As a poor um, college graduate, Jordan had to borrow $300 from Denver Public School recruiter just to make the trip to Colorado. He wore the same brown suit to school for three years. He told his very first class, I can retire in the year 2000. We ought to meet somewhere in that, on that New Year's Day and everybody bring a dollar because I'm going to need it. His students remembered. The dollars they brought were donated to the Catholic Work Soup Kitchen. The difference of a great idea. Bonnie McClurg understands how to make a difference. As a reading teacher at Chandler Elementary School in Charleston, West Virginia, Bonnie changes lives. Nine years ago, she observed that students brought snacks from school, or sorry, bought snacks from school vending machines every day. This prompted her to think and take a leap forward. Why not make books as easy and inexpensive to buy as snack food? Quickly moving on to her idea, she found a way to stock books alongside the pretzels and corn chips that were inside the vending machine. Since then, students have been able to purchase like books like The Velveteen Rabbit and Amazing World of Dinosaurs for just 50 cents marked down from as much as $7.95. It was any, it, is it any surprise that more than 1,000 books have been purchased by eager students? Bonnie did not sit on her ideas, she made it happen, and she showed students that books can be enjoyable snacks too, ones that are always good for them. Three difference making strategies. There are good ways and not so good ways to go about influencing your world. Here are some proven standards for doing it right. Strategy number one, identify when you'll make a difference. When can you make a difference? At every opportunity. Remember, nobody is forcing you to do extraordinary things. If your attempts at being a friend become an oppressive duty, you're bound to fail. You're making a difference because like most of the Freds I've encountered, you want to and you can. Strategy number two, target the people to whom you'll make a difference. Fred the Postman seems intent on providing exceptional service to all of his customers. Is that possible for you and me? The answer is, it depends. I believe that doing a great job for everyone that you serve at home or in business is possible. Undoubtedly, there are those people, whoever, however, whom you may want to do something extraordinary for. The most important people in our lives deserve our best attention. Customers. It would have been easy to write a book on customer service and use Fred the Postman as the primary illustration. But I wanted what I've learned from Fred and others like him to go beyond the marketplace and into every area of human relationships. I do acknowledge, however, that perhaps the easiest application and quickest payoffs are to begin by serving your customers as Fred, Fred served me. You'll instantly earn his attention and soon their unwavering devotion. Family. How, could your how would your spouse react if you demonstrated Fred-like care and commitment to him or her? Or maybe think of your parents. What about your kids? One of the sadder things in life is to know that someone loves you, but to rarely experience it. You can transform ordinary family interactions and events into extraordinary moments and experiences by applying these principles at home. What about your boss? Would you like to work for an incredible boss? 
Then start by treating your boss like an incredible person. Do extraordinary things for him or her over time, and I bet you'll notice a difference in your relationship. And if you don't, it's time to look for a new boss. Teammates. High performance teams are made up of high performance teammates. Somebody has to go first, so why not you? Become the friend of your team or department and watch as others are positively affected. Friends and strangers. What are you doing to enrich the lives of those that you know and those you don't? The only thing more fantastic than experiencing an active friend from someone you know is experiencing it from a complete stranger. It restores one's faith in the potential of human behavior. Strategy number three, be the difference. A little thought and reflection will quickly help you to see the difference that you can make in any activity or event. Often our lives are so busy and stressful that we don't have time to consider the differences that would enrich and add value to whatever we do for others. This means that we must make time for our schedules or in our schedules to determine how we can change our ordinary actions into extraordinary ones. Just as athletes prepare for competition in pregame meetings, we too should prepare for our daily activities with pregame thought. Once we know the difference we can make, our challenge is to be the difference maker. The Bible says that it's an in, this is an interesting sorry. The Bible says this in an interesting way. Be a doer of the word and not hearers only. True difference cannot be neglected. It is up to us to take action. What kind of difference will you make today? More to come. Okay, success is built on relationships. And the quote that goes along with this chapter is from John Maxwell. You add value to people when you value them. So one evening before making my presentation at a sales conference, I discovered that the vice president of sales for a large food products firm and I were both big motorheads, car lovers. Do you read Auto Week, he asked. At the time, I wasn't familiar with the publication, but after he told me about the magazine and what it covered, I made a mental note to subscribe to it. My fellow motorhead was one step ahead of me. The next morning before my speech, he handed me a subs subscription card that he had pulled out from his most recent issue. I was struck by how thoughtful this small gesture was. As a result, I use a similar technique when I talk with friends and clients about books. If I find out that there is a really great title that they have not read, I'll order a copy and have it sent to them with my compliments. That way we both get a lot of satisfaction and we also fortify our bond with each other and extend the range of our conversations. That's quite a payoff for a simple act of relationship building. Success is about one relationship at a time. Every day we interact with dozens of people. Often those interactions are fleeting and unmemorable. Friends, however, don't use people as a means to an end. They use relationships to build a foundation for success. They understand that all outcomes are created by and through interactions with others. So they become students of social psychology. They understand that strong relationships create loyalty and are the basis of partnerships and teamwork. The best friends build networks to develop distribution channels for their talents, and they strive to work well with others whether one-on-one -on -one with a customer or in a team with colleagues. Remember that the quality of a relationship is directly related to the amount of time invested in it. Make sure that you give some of your best time to your relationships. Fred's build relationships even with three-year-olds. HMOs and PPOs have prescribed limits on the amount of types of services that they allow healthcare providers to give. Despite these limitations, there are still extraordinary healthcare workers who focus on what they can do instead of what they can't. With all the complaining about healthcare, you might not expect to find a stellar example of a Fred in this field. Yet Dan, a physician's assess assistant at a pediat pediatrics office, is a Fred. Imagine working day in and day out with sick kids. One day my wife Darla took our three-year-old son Hunter for an examination. We wanted to be sure that a fall on the grandparents' coffee table hadn't broken his nose. Hunter was sitting on the floor when Dan came in. After a cheerful greeting, Dan plopped down on the floor next to him. Hunter watched suspiciously while snacking on pretzels. Hey dude, can I have one? asked Dan. Like most children, Hunter became a little bit leery of what he sometimes has to experience during examinations at the doctor's office. So it wasn't surprising when Hunter's eyes got a little bigger as Dan brazenly reached out and took a pretzel from the bag. Suddenly, a big smile broke out across my son's face. Dan proceeded to interact in medical terms in normal language as he and Hunter played. They wrestled and goofed around and Dan tried Hunter's shoelaces together. Sorry, Dan tied Hunter's shoelaces together. 
When Hunter saw this, he tried to walk and predictably he tripped. He loved it and laughed with glee. After several minutes of frivolity, Dan was able to examine a totally stress-free little boy and Hunter probably thought that he'd misjudged the situation and wasn't really in a medical facility at all. Dan knew what to do. Not only did he perform his examination with a minimum amount of fuss, but he actually eliminated the fears of a three-year-old. Now that's Fred-like relationship building at its best. The seven B's of relationship building. In today's technology-driven world, relationship building might be considered a lost art form or pretty normal for all of us right now because we're all doing technology relationships. Most of us have uh, never been taught about how to go about building relationships with others. Whatever we've learned, we've picked up through observation of role models rather than from conscious learning. We are lucky if we have a good role model when we were growing up and not so lucky if we didn't. Do you want to improve your relationships at home and at work? The following principles will definitely help. The first one, or the first B, is be real. Aside from Fred's extraordinary customer focus, what was most inspiring about him was his uniqueness. He was who he was. I never got the sense from Fred that he was trying to impress me by being anybody but himself. This is the direct opposite of the prevailing wisdom in our culture today, which is fake it until you make it. The intent is to become who you want to be by acting as if you are already that person. The only problem with this strategy is that you're faking. Try this alternative. Always do your best at being yourself. Sure, you should aim to improve and try new things and add value, but let these actions come out of who you really are and what you truly believe in and the things that you are committed to. The prerequisite for relationship building is trust. At its most basic level, trust is built on believing that people are who they represent themselves to be. The second B, be interested, not just interesting. It may be true that interesting people attract attention, but I believe that interested people attract appreciation. When I first met Fred, he quickly introduced himself, but the focus was on how he could best help me meet my needs. I instantly liked Fred because he showed a genuine interest in me, not because he was interesting. Although I learned over time that he certainly is. If Fred had spent time telling me what a great mailman he was, the outcome would have been very different. People are flattered when you express an interest in getting to know them better, not out of morbid curiosity, but in an effort to help them or to serve them more effectively. Appreciating the people that we serve, I believe, increases the value of our service to them. Number three, be a better listener. When you take an interest in and listen to people, they provide important practical information that you can use to create value. For instance, listen carefully to your boss and you might learn that he or she hates to read long memos. You now know that you can improve your working relationship by providing a brief summary. Or at a lunch, ask a client about her family. You might learn that her 14-year-old son has a hobby and one of your children enjoys it also. Offering to exchange information about that shared interest will add both value and depth to this relationship. People are flattered when you make an effort to get to know them and to seek information on how to serve them better. Understanding and appreciating what they want increases the value of what can be provided for them. Number four, be empathetic. If you're interested in others and make the effort to truly know them by listening to them, you'll better understand how they feel. This is empathy. The need to be understood is one of the highest human needs, but too often people who know us either don't care or don't make the effort to understand how we really feel. 2,000 years ago, a wise na man named Filio Judaeus said, Be kind. Everyone you meet is fighting some kind of tough battle. Not much has changed since. His counsel is the essence of practical empathy. Number five, be honest. I summarize all business strategy with this simple idea. Say what you'll do and do what you say. In other words, don't make promises that you can't keep. Don't create expectations that you can't fulfill. Avoid over-representing and over-promising. Be a man, woman, or organization of your word. That's integrity. Number six, be helpful. Little things make a big difference. Lots of small things accumulatively make a huge difference. Years ago, my friend Ken taught me a neat way to be a service to strangers. If I see one person in a group taking a picture of all the others, I offer to snap the picture so everybody can be included. Even holding a door open is an indication of a Fred-like behavior. So remember your manners and people will remember you. Be prompt. 
Time is the one thing that many people have far less of than money. Helping them save time by being prompt and efficient is a gift of great value. So these are all simple ways to be a friend. Beyond interactions, here's a test. What percentage of your interactions with others is transactional as opposed to relational? Transactional interactions focus primarily on results, sometimes even at a cost of relationships. People who value results over relationships are often called direct. That means that they can go directly from the outcome, making others feel devalued and even used. Relational interactions emphasize the importance of how people are treated in the process of achieving results. This type of interaction doesn't ignore the outcome, but it does recognize the means are an important part of the end. Fred the Postman was living proof that how you deliver the mail affects how people feel about the outcome. Not every interaction needs to be relational. Sometimes a lack of time or the situation just doesn't allow for it. For example, in an emergency or crisis, getting people to safely evacuate a burning building might require harsh direct instructions. Jimmy Buffett said once, and I paraphrase, it takes just about the same amount of time to be a nice guy as it does to be a jerk. More often than not, you and I can be more Fred-like by taking time to focus on the relational aspect of our interactions. It doesn't take much extra time or effort to be interested and demonstrate the value that we have for others, especially those on whom we depend for mutual success. Think about your family, your teamwork, um, anything that you've done in a, in a group or at school or anything like that. And that is the essence of building relationships, whether business or personal. And that brings us to the end of our reading for this week. Best of luck as you complete your prompt and then also do your choice board for the week. Let me know if you have questions. You can always email me or call me at my Google voice number or text there. It is 913-795-1215. Peace. Okay, success is built on relationships. And the quote that goes along with this chapter is from John Maxwell. You add value to people when you value them. So one evening before making my presentation at a sales conference, I discovered that the vice president of sales for a large food products firm and I were both big motorheads, car lovers. Do you read Auto Week, he asked. At the time, I wasn't familiar with the publication, but after he told me about the magazine and what it covered, I made a mental note to subscribe to it. My fellow motorhead was one step ahead of me. The next morning before my speech, he handed me a subs subscription card that he had pulled out from his most recent issue. I was struck by how thoughtful this small gesture was. As a result, I use a similar technique when I talk with friends and clients about books. If I find out that there is a really great title that they have not read, I'll order a copy and have it sent to them with my compliments. That way we both get a lot of satisfaction and we also fortify our bond with each other and extend the range of our conversations. That's quite a payoff for a simple act of relationship building. Success is about one relationship at a time. Every day we interact with dozens of people. Often those interactions are fleeting and unmemorable. Friends, however, don't use people as a means to an end. They use relationships to build a foundation for success. They understand that all outcomes are created by and through interactions with others. So they become students of social psychology. They understand that strong relationships create loyalty and are the basis of partnerships and teamwork. The best friends build networks to develop distribution channels for their talents, and they strive to work well with others whether one-on-one -on -one with a customer or in a team with colleagues. Remember that the quality of a relationship is directly related to the amount of time invested in it. Make sure that you give some of your best time to your relationships. Fred's build relationships even with three-year-olds. HMOs and PPOs have prescribed limits on the amount of types of services that they allow healthcare providers to give. Despite these limitations, there are still extraordinary healthcare workers who focus on what they can do instead of what they can't. With all the complaining about healthcare, you might not expect to find a stellar example of a Fred in this field. Yet Dan, a physician's assess assistant at a pediatrics office, is a Fred. Imagine working day in and day out with sick kids. One day my wife Darla took our three-year-old son Hunter for an examination. We wanted to be sure that a fall on the grandparents' coffee table hadn't broken his nose. Hunter was sitting on the floor when Dan came in. After a cheerful greeting, Dan plopped down on the floor next to him. 
Hunter watched suspiciously while snacking on pretzels. Hey dude, can I have one? asked Dan. Like most children, Hunter became a little bit leery of what he sometimes has to experience during examinations at the doctor's office. So it wasn't surprising when Hunter's eyes got a little bigger as Dan brazenly reached out and took a pretzel from the bag. Suddenly, a big smile broke out across my son's face. Dan proceeded to interact in medical terms in normal language as he and Hunter played. They wrestled and goofed around and Dan tried Hunter's shoelaces together. Sorry, Dan tied Hunter's shoelaces together. When Hunter saw this, he tried to walk and predictably he tripped. He loved it and laughed with glee. After several minutes of frivolity, Dan was able to examine a totally stress-free little boy and Hunter probably thought that he'd misjudged the situation and wasn't really in a medical facility at all. Dan knew what to do. Not only did he perform his examination with a minimum amount of fuss, but he actually eliminated the fears of a three-year-old. Now that's Fred-like relationship building at its best. The seven B's of relationship building. In today's technology-driven world, relationship building might be considered a lost art form, or pretty normal for all of us right now because we're all doing technology relationships. Most of us have uh, never been taught about how to go about building relationships with others. Whatever we've learned, we've picked up through observation of role models rather than from conscious learning. We are lucky if we have a good role model when we were growing up and not so lucky if we didn't. Do you want to improve your relationships at home and at work? The following principles will definitely help. The first one, or the first B, is be real. Aside from Fred's extraordinary customer focus, what was most inspiring about him was his uniqueness. He was who he was. I never got the sense from Fred that he was trying to impress me by being anybody but himself. This is the direct opposite of the prevailing wisdom in our culture today, which is fake it until you make it. The intent is to become who you want to be by acting as if you are already that person. The only problem with this strategy is that you're faking. Try this alternative. Always do your best at being yourself. Sure, you should aim to improve and try new things and add value, but let these actions come out of who you really are and what you truly believe in and the things that you are committed to. The prerequisite for relationship building is trust. At its most basic level, trust is built on believing that people are who they represent themselves to be. The second B, be interested, not just interesting. It may be true that interesting people attract attention, but I believe that interested people attract appreciation. When I first met Fred, he quickly introduced himself, but the focus was on how he could best help me meet my needs. I instantly liked Fred because he showed a genuine interest in me, not because he was interesting. Although I learned over time that he certainly is. If Fred had spent time telling me what a great mailman he was, the outcome would have been very different. People are flattered when you express an interest in getting to know them better, not out of morbid curiosity, but in an effort to help them or to serve them more effectively. Appreciating the people that we serve, I believe, increases the value of our service to them. Number three, be a better listener. When you take an interest in and listen to people, they provide important practical information that you can use to create value. For instance, listen carefully to your boss and you might learn that he or she hates to read long memos. You now know that you can improve your working relationship by providing a brief summary. Or at a lunch, ask a client about her family. You might learn that her 14-year-old son has a hobby and one of your children enjoys it also. Offering to exchange information about that shared interest will add both value and depth to this relationship. People are flattered when you make an effort to get to know them and to seek information on how to serve them better. Understanding and appreciating what they want increases the value of what can be provided for them. Number four, be empathetic. If you're interested in others and make the effort to truly know them by listening to them, you'll better understand how they feel. This is empathy. The need to be understood is one of the highest human needs, but too often people who know us either don't care or don't make the effort to understand how we really feel. 2,000 years ago, a wise na man named Filio Judaeus said, Be kind. Everyone you meet is fighting some kind of tough battle. Not much has changed since. His counsel is the essence of practical empathy. Number five, be honest. I summarize all business strategy with this simple idea. Say what you'll do and do what you say. In other words, don't make promises that you can't keep. Don't create expectations that you can't fulfill. 
Avoid overrepresenting and overpromising. Be a man, woman, or organization of your word. That's integrity. Number six, be helpful. Little things make a big difference. Lots of small things accumulatively make a huge difference. Years ago, my friend Ken taught me a neat way to be a service to strangers. If I see one person in a group taking a picture of all the others, I offer to snap the picture so everybody can be included. Even holding a door open is an indication of a Fred-like behavior. So remember your manners and people will remember you. Be prompt. Time is the one thing that many people have far less of than money. Helping them save time by being prompt and efficient is a gift of great value. So these are all simple ways to be a friend. Beyond interactions, here's a test. What percentage of your interactions with others is transactional as opposed to relational? Transactional interactions focus primarily on results, sometimes even at a cost of relationships. People who value results over relationships are often called direct. That means that they can go directly from the outcome, making others feel devalued and even used. Relational interactions emphasize the importance of how people are treated in the process of achieving results. This type of interaction doesn't ignore the outcome, but it does recognize the means are an important part of the end. Fred the Postman was living proof that how you deliver the mail affects how people feel about the outcome. Not every interaction needs to be relational. Sometimes a lack of time or the situation just doesn't allow for it. For example, in an emergency or crisis, getting people to safely evacuate a burning building might require harsh direct instructions. Jimmy Buffett said once, and I paraphrase, it takes just about the same amount of time to be a nice guy as it does to be a jerk. More often than not, you and I can be more Fred-like by taking time to focus on the relational aspect of our interactions. It doesn't take much extra time or effort to be interested and demonstrate the value that we have for others especially those on whom we depend for mutual success. Think about your family, your teamwork, um, anything that you've done in a, in a group or at school or anything like that. And that is the essence of building relationships, whether business or personal. And that brings us to the end of our reading for this week. Best of luck as you complete your prompt and then also do your choice board for the week. Let me know if you have questions. You can always email me or call me at my Google Voice number or text there. It is 913-795-1215. Peace.